I'm going to go down, down to a lo lower page here a little bit first. Okay. So, if, how many people need one of these? Raise your hand if you need one. I have a Well, shoot. Well, I'll post these on Canvas so you can print it if you don't have one right now. Um, I had a big stack of them that I left out here for people to grab. I don't know where they went. Okay. So, so you just have to draw awkwardly until I can find some more of these for you. Or print some more. Okay. So, what this is, is this is a what we call a sagittal view of the brain. Sagittal view to the side. Okay? And when we look at this sagittal view of the brain, where is the, where's your nose? Which, which toward the door or toward me? Door. So I'm going to draw the nose on here. Okay, and here's your eyeball. Okay? Now, technically, I'm going to draw this more to scale. Hold on. So I want you to kind of see how this is. And I have a video of my mother-in-law's brain, which will fly through here shortly. Actually, it doesn't work on this. There's your... You know, you're killing me, Smalls. Okay. Come on. There you go. Okay, so your nose would be right here. There we go. Much better. Okay. So as we're looking at the brain, anything that is closer to the nose is called rostral. It means closer to the nose. Anything that goes around and further closer to the tail would be caudal. Rostral. Rostral rhinal dactylia is people who pick their nose. Okay. Um, caudal is going toward their tail. When you're caudaling someone, you're holding them and patting them on the bottom. You're being caudaled like a baby. Okay. So the back surface of the brain, which, which is irritating because humans went and stood up, um, the back surface of the brain is called the dorsal. The dorsal surface of the brain goes all the way across the top and all the way down toward the caudal on the back. What's the stomach surface called? The ventral surface of the brain. Let me go find my rat brain for you. <clears throat> Next class we'll have a little activity with actually get to play with brains. You can pass this around. Please don't open it. The chemical in there causes cancer in 48 states. If you're in two states, they don't recognize it as causing cancer, so you're okay. It's formaldehyde. That's all. Okay. So ventral surface would be anything from inside your eyeballs all the way down the front of the brain and all the way down your body. <laughs> ventral surface. If you look at the rat brain, the rat brain is shaped like this. So its dorsal surface is very simple. 
But somehow a human decided to stand up at some point, and so our ventral surface takes an angle. Our dorsal surface takes an angle. So dorsal surface back here, ventral surface toward the front. So if I say the dorsal nucleus, or dorsal raphe technically, is it on the back or the front? It's on the back. Okay, so the ventral roots we'll talk about. Ventral tegmental areas, they are closer to the, the front. Okay, anything that is, let me switch brains here real quick. That's just a slice down the middle, still sagittal slice. Okay, so here is a slice that goes, oh, that's kind of cool. Okay, it's called a coronal slice, but anything that is toward the center is called medial. Anything that's toward the outside is called lateral. So the medial nuclei are the ones toward the middle, and lateral are towards the sides. So this part of the brain right here, we'll, we'll talk about in a few minutes with the details. This is the thalamus. There's a medial thalamus, which is the inside, and the lateral part of the thalamus is on the outside. So even though the thalamus has two separate lobes, when you talk about the medial, you're talking about the ones that are toward the center. When you're talking about lateral, it's the ones that are toward the outside. Okay, let's see. These are the lateral ventricles because they are toward the side. And that's called the third ventricle for some reason, not the medial ventricle, but that's not important. Okay, so let's see. Where's the dorsal surface of this person's brain that we're looking at right here? Whatever. Where's the dorsal surface? On top. That's the dorsal surface. The ventral surface would be in the, down in here, towards the middle. Okay? Um, so when you look at a person's brain, how do I know which way is the front versus which way is the back? Say it again. Yeah, so we're looking at the brain stem. So where, how do I know where his, this person's nose is? That way. So whenever you're trying to look at a brain, always try to figure out which way that person whose brain it was, was looking. Because that's how we decide left and right, is from the perspective of whose ever brain this is. Okay? So this, this, what side of the brain are we looking at right here? Which way are they facing? That way. So they're looking at their, well it's sliced down the middle, but you're looking at the left side, and the right side is coming from the other direction. So technically, because this is a slice, this is the guy's or person's right hemisphere. Because their left hemisphere has been cut off. Okay? This, this other picture right here is an actual picture of their left hemisphere. When you cut it down, yeah. So if I were to flip this over, this way. Okay, so now I just switched hemispheres on you. So now it's looking down and slightly obscure, but whatever. I'll fix that. Okay. For those OCD people, that would be irritating for being slightly upset. I like it though. Okay. So let's see. What else do you need to know? Uh, which means on top, superior or inferior? Superior. superior. Yeah, it's a. We used to. I worked at a research lab, so we used to sadly dissect a lot of rats. Because what we do is we treat, treat them with alcohol prenatally and then look at their brains. So you have to take their brains out. Well, not cool for the rat. I had an ulcer for a long time working there because I love animals and it was very hard. But, okay. So you have to hold the rat brain, okay. <laughs> so I went home with that in my pocket once, I forgot. Didn't go through the wash though, that would stink. Thank you. Um, I would love to do a sheep brain dissection in here, which is really cool if anybody's ever done one. Um, it's, but the smell is so bad. 
I had dissected it with my son's classroom. Like for days, I couldn't get that smell out of my, my head. Just ugh, that form, the bioform formalin smell. Ugh. Okay. Um, okay, so we need a few more words here before we can go through and finish this. Um, let's put these down here. So what is a nerve? Come on, you all have nerves. <clears throat> I'm standing on my wife's all the time. <laughs> At least that's what she says. Okay. What's a nerve? Well, it's good use of language, sir. Yeah. It's, uh, shit. You all pinched one at some point in your life. <laughs> you guys are thinking way too much. A nerve is a bundle of axons. Where is a nerve? No. A nerve is our axons that are outside the brain and spine. It's important because where do you pinch nerves? In your joints, in your, in your elbow, in your neck. Your neck's got lots of nerves that come out of it. Your whole face goes right into two vertebrae in the back of your neck. And that gets out of alignment just a little bit. And I'm going to get the, the, one of these. Ow. Yeah, you have one right now? Nice. This is, sounds the most painful thing ever. Ice it. You know, you get one of those things, you just want to heat it up and try to warm it up. That's actually the worst thing because it increases blood flow. And by increasing the blood flow, it increases the swelling. It makes it worse. But it feels so good right at the moment. Take an ice pack and put it on that nerve. It'll shrink the swelling around the nerve and allows the nerve to move freely and allows the muscle to move freely. So it's very counterintuitive, but... I said, I get, I, I used to get those a lot, um, probably because I had a nerve, that, a disc in my neck that was slightly out of whack, because I used to do this all the time, but I don't do that anymore because, because it's bad for your neck, it turns out. <laughs> Moving on. Okay, so I'm going to write a word tract up here. Guess what a tract is? So a tract is a group of axons inside the brain and spine. The optic nerve turns into the optic tract once it enters the skull. Optic nerve means it's a bundle of axons outside of your brain, and then once it goes through the skull, it becomes the optic tract. Just you'll, you'll understand why we need to know these words in a little bit here. Um, so then there's also a, the word ganglia. So ganglia, except for the basal ganglia, except the, the rest of them are true, the ganglia are cell bodies outside the brain. Cell bodies outside the brain. You have a bunch of eye, cell bodies, a bunch of neurons in your eyeball itself. Okay, the ganglion cells in your retina help you see. But why are they called ganglion cells, not a part of your brain? They're outside. The ventral root ganglia and the dorsal root ganglia in your spinal cord have different sensory, ones for movement, ones for feeling. But they're neurons outside of the brain and spine. Okay, but so what do we call a cluster of cell bodies inside the brain? It's called a nucleus. Nucleus. So what we have is we have a list of terms that help you start understanding the names that are given to the parts of the brain. 
The names of the brain are based on where they are mostly. Sometimes they're based on what they look like when you dissect them, which doesn't really help us understand what they are because they just are what they look like. Sometimes they're labeled by the tract. There's some tracts of axons that release dopamine, the tegmental pathway. And those tracts of axons are going through the, the pleasure centers of your brain. We'll show you what those are in a little bit here. Maybe not today, maybe next time. Okay, so you have these tracts of axons inside the brain. Um, you have, what do nerves on the outside of your brain do? These are my teeth. Well, sensory signals go in. What comes out? Well, what commands does the body have? What's the only command the body has? Impulses. Luckily, I have control over my impulses. Impulse control drugs, sorry. What's the only commands that come out? Ooh, that'd be cool. Okay. That'd be nice. Movement! Contraction of muscles or activation of glands. Well, that's it. The only information that comes out of our brain is movement. Sensory world comes in, movement comes out. That's it. That's all we are. But then we have this really crazy thing called language. What can you move? Well, yes, you can constrict muscles in your voice. What can you move? Ideas. You can move your ideas. That's what language is. You take your ideas in your head, you pack them in a little ball, and you throw them at people. Some people dodge them and don't listen. Other people hear them and go, oh, and it changes the way they think. Think about that for a little bit. Humans haven't really changed in the last 5,000 years. But what has changed? Our ideas have changed in the last 5,000 years. We're the same basic humans except minus a few teeth as we were back then. But... Ideas have changed. And Apple. Okay, and moving on. So, just keep thinking about that, because it's like... Yeah, the Flynn effect. That humans really aren't changing. Our brains are the same brains that we had 5,000 years ago. The nice thing is that some Egyptians, like, kept stuff in jars with chemicals in it that kept it fresh. And so we can unpack a, a jar with someone's brain in it and look at it and, hey, it's the same brain that we have now. There are, are there ideas different than we have now? Yeah. Yeah, we have a much more global world space view. Well, some of us do. Okay, moving on. So, kind of neat to think about. So trying to figure out where your thoughts are in this entire thing, yuck. Okay, so down at the bottom of this page, what do I have? Oh, it's not on this one. Not on, the, not on this document that I have right here. What do you have at the back of yours? The list. Okay, so we can, we can go through the list in a couple different ways. Um, this is what we call a horizontal view, by the way, just in case you're looking, this is a horizontal view. Which way is this person facing? That way. This is looking at the top of their brain. They're facing down. No, well, I guess they're lying this way. Okay, so this person is facing that way. Their eyeball would be here, eyeball would be here. This would be the person's right hemisphere. This would be the person's left hemisphere, okay? Here's the back of the brain. We're looking at the dorsal surface of the brain. Dorsal surface of the brain. I don't know. Okay. Oh, uh, do I have the bottom one up here? 
I might not. This might be a different. This might be a slightly different handout from. Why is SPSS open? Dang it. Yes. I know, flash, sorry. So people just took stats and so don't have to take it again. Okay. I don't have glasses. Where'd they go? What happened? Oh, well. Syllabus, physio final exam, 2019. Uh, let's see. <laughs> there. Syllabus. Well, okay, fine. Well, that doesn't help me because I need to, I, I want to put it up here. I'll draw it because it'll be awesome. So let's go through some of these ones that we do have. So give me some parts. All right. Let's start, let's start down at the bottom. You all have this one, right? You should have this one. All right. So this is what we call the hind brain. This is the hind brain. The hind brain is the low parts of the brain, or we also use the term brainstem. What does the brainstem do? Yeah. Autonomic functions. Now this brainstem actually has the upper part called the midbrain attached to it. This part is called the midbrain. And you can't really see it from this side, but it's right here. So autonomic functions, what, what does the word autonomic mean? Are they backwards on yours? Yeah, but you can tell. So you can tell the, the, the images by looking at the structure. So let's look at the bottom. The bottom of the brain right here is called the medulla. The bottom of the brain is called the medulla. The medulla, that's a terrible A, controls sympathetic ganglia. So the word sympathetic, the, the word sympathetic doesn't mean aw. Sympathetic means rah. Okay? But sympathetic, what's it? Ganglia, what does that mean? Cell bodies outside the brain. So the medulla controls the sympathetic ganglia. When the medulla activates the sympathetic ganglia, when the medulla activates the sympathetic ganglia, we have blood pressure goes up. Respiration goes up. Heart rate goes up. So the sympathetic ganglia is a pathway that runs down your ventral part of your spine. And it activates and it causes increase in blood pressure, increase in respiration, increase in heart rate. Why on earth would we want to activate this? So you run faster, jump higher, swim faster, don't get eaten as fast. Okay, it's a fight or flight. We call it the attack or escape. But what it does is it gets your, it primes your body so that you respond. So what happens when we stop activating the sympathetic ganglia? Let we put some inhibitory chemicals on the sympathetic ganglia. Everything slows down. It's called called parasympathetic response. So we have the medulla has two really important things. Has, it activates the sympathetic ganglia, but also has what's called a parasympathetic response. So as fast as you ramp up, what does your parasympathetic system do? It's the brakes that stop it from revving up too much. So those people in here that, if you can, you, some people in here have twitchy medullas, that your medulla ramps up very quickly. 
my wife's side of the family, her dad and her, her mom and my wife, all ramp up very quickly. They, they, call, they, they somaticize things. So whenever they think about something stressful, what happens immediately? They don't, the stress is irrelevant. It's, they don't freak out. Their body responds immediately, very fast, sympathetic arousal. Other people, like I don't have very fast sympathetic arousal. I have very slow sympathetic arousal. Um, my kids very rarely have seen me get mad. <laughs> when I, and I, don't, I just don't get angry, don't get that flustered that much. And it's because my sympathetic arousal is slow. It takes me 15 to 20 minutes to warm up before I can work out. <laughs> so if I only work out for an hour, I'm warming up for a large portion of the time to, before I can work out. Because otherwise I can't, eh, I just don't have the go juice. But if I warm up really well, I do very well. And so that's because, but my wife, however, can just go for her warm up for her run. She gets dressed. She has a half a cup of coffee. And she goes outside and stretches her calves on the curb. And then she's off, full speed. Like, seriously. And... But for me, it's like, okay, if I'm going to go for a run, it's like that's a good half an hour's worth of stretching and getting everything ready to go. Then I can go for a run. Yeah, it's a process. It's not totally not worth it, though, because I get about a half a mile in and everything hurts and I want to quit. So I don't like running. It's not good for me. Um, but so the, the, the fun part about this, this medulla response is, is that this is how your body reacts from your mental. All the connections between your thoughts and your body are going through your medulla. So all, what is your medulla doing on the upside then? What's it doing? Go, that's what it's doing going down. What's it happening coming up? Yeah. Is it telling your body what your, is it telling your brain what your body's doing currently? It's not even, that's suggesting that it has some sort of consciousness in it. There's nothing. I want you to look at this. Information on the, let's see, this person is, looking toward you, okay, this is the, this is looking at the ventral surface of their brain, so what side of the spinal cord is this? Person's looking at you, so it's their, their left hand, right, that's why we're, we have to look at this from the perspective of the brain, <coughs> okay, so all the information from the left side of the body is going up the left side of the medulla. We use the word ipsilateral. Ipsa means same. Lateral means side. Ipsilateral. So the information on the left side goes where? Up the left side. It does go to the right eventually, but not yet. So the medulla really is just a fancy part of your spinal cord. It's no different. Your entire spinal, entire spinal cord is ipsilateral from the caudal equinus down at the bottom all the way up and through the medulla, all the way up into this structure called the pons here, all the way up into the pons, it's ipsilateral. What do you kind of notice about the pons? Let me zoom in a little bit. What do you notice about the structure of the pons? I moved the picture back to Okay, it's definitely bigger. What else about it? Look at, the, look at the neurons. Can you see them going across? Well, yeah, so all these little bumps and grooves seem to be going side to side across, like this. So the pons is contralateral. Sorry, I keep moving that. So the pons is contralateral. When I say the pons is contralateral, that means that the information from the left is now going where? It's okay. Now the information is going into the right side. So below the pons, it's ipsilateral. Above the pons, it's contralateral. So 
in the pods, pods is really important, there's all these big nerves sticking into the pods. These are called the cranial nerves. So I'm not asking you to memorize which cranial nerve does what, but the diff there's, I think, 14 different or 12 different cranial nerves. And the cranial nerves come in. For example, your eyeball nerves, they come in right here. Here's your eyeball nerves. This one's a little bit kind of weird how it looks, isn't it? It's not like perfect. The brains aren't perfect. What shapes the way these look? Your perception. Well, your, your use. This person definitely looks like they were one side dominant over the other side. See how both nerves tend to go to one side and the side they don't necessarily go directly to? So I would suggest that this person had much better vision in one eye than the other eye. But we'll see. I mean, that's, we can't see because they're dead. Okay. So on the, on the surface of the brain, the bottom surface of the brain, you guys have that picture? There's two huge structures on the bottom surface of the brain. Okay? They're right here. They kind of look like they come out and they go toward the front. If you look at the rat brain, if you look at the rat brain, oh, one of them fell off. Oh, no, it's still there. That's okay. The rat brain has this huge structure. This is where you smell. It's called the olfactory bulb. And where, what structure do you think is right underneath those two little things? What's right here on the rat? It's nose. The human nose, right on the roof of our nose, up inside of our brain, that's where our olfactory bulbs are, right above each eye. Okay, but those, that's where you smell. That's where the sense of smell is. Smell goes directly from your face, directly into your brain. Vision goes directly into the optic nerve, and then the optic nerve turns into the optic... Crap. Okay? So far so good? Okay. So the cranial nerves bring all the sensations from the head and face into the brain almost directly. Into the brain almost directly. Where does all your body sensation come from? Comes through the spinal cord up the medulla. Okay? Good, good, good. So in the back, okay, so... On the, if you look at the bottom of the brain, you see these big cauliflower-looking things. Hanging off of this, I can show you a picture down here. This thing. This is the cerebellum. Now, on this one, it's cut off so you can actually see the structures inside. The reason I like to show this, this picture is you can see the ipsilateral... And then you can see right after the cerebellum, they connect. Ipsilateral, contralateral. Is the cerebellum ipsilateral or contralateral? Ipsilateral. It's ipsilateral. It's on the same side. So the cerebellum that's on your... this Now we're looking at the back of the person. So the cerebellum on the person's right is coordinating information with the person's right side. Cerebellum on the left is coordinating information with the person's left side. So the cerebellum is all about timing. That red is like really satisfying for me. Cerebellum is timing. Coordination. Why would we put timing and coordination by the spinal cord? and comes from. So the cerebellum is sitting right in between the sensory information coming up and the motor signals coming down. Sensory information coming up, motor signals going down. The cerebellum are these huge structures, these terrifically integrated cells that are paying attention to the sensory information coming up and the body movement coming down. So how does a knee-jerk reflex work? How does it, how do you get a knee-jerk reflex? Bang someone on the knee, which causes the spinal cord to flex the muscle. 
I tried in my winter session class, I banged on the poor girl's knee for about two minutes, and it didn't, she didn't have any reflexes whatsoever, and just had a bruised knee afterwards. So I'm not going to bang on anybody's knee. But if you hit the knee in the right spot, what can you do? If you let your leg kicks. And what's annoying about it is, can you not have it not kick? I mean, can you like hold your leg against it? No, the harder you fight against it, it'll still kick because it's a spinal cord reflex. So the cerebellum is just like those spinal cord reflexes, except it's ex it causes, ex no, it causes, it's extremely more complicated. It can integrate thousands of bits of stimuli into producing reflex-like behavior. That's where you learn. This is where classical conditioning occurs. It's timing. Okay? So, Yeah, so you can easily, that's the cerebellum. Cerebellum, the Mr. Twitmire from intro um, played a buzzing, uh, his electric machine that caused knee-jerk reflexes made sound. So he discovered that sometimes the hammer wouldn't hit the person's knee, would they still kick? Yes, which is very irritating for, for physiologists, because like, the, oh, you're, you're faking it. Not faking it. If you get sick eating a chicken taco, and then you smell a chicken taco, or you feel like you're getting sick again, Perfectly. Um, and that's just because your cerebellum goes, hey, I know that. Why do I say reflex like? Why is it important that it's like a reflex? Yeah, it's, it mimics a reflex. In other words, it's unconscious. So these little spots right here, called colliculi. There's the, the superior colliculi and the inferior colliculi. These colliculi are these little bumps on the back. I'm going to erase them so you can see the little bumps better. Drew all over the four little bumps. Can you see the four little bumps there? Okay. This is tricky. These four little bumps, okay, well, let's, let's do the top two, the superior colliculi. Take visual information, take visual information, and attach it to the cerebellum. So these connect the cerebellum with your visual system. So if I have to, here, Marvin, how can he catch that? Throw it back. Okay. How can I catch that? almost didn't catch that, but I did. As I see it coming, do you adjust the movement of the hand to catch it? Um, I, was, I'm always, I used to be actually really bad at catching things <laughs> until I got my eyeballs lasered. Once I got my eyeballs lasered, my, I have very much better depth perception. Um, it's really good. I used to coach Little League. And when you coach Little League, kids don't throw very accurately. So what do you have to do? No. You either get hit or you work on your ninja skills. That's why a lot of coaches carry a glove. It's not really because they like wearing a baseball glove. It's just to protect themselves. Because as soon as you put the baseball glove on your hand, the ball is flying towards you. What do you learn? You, you actually, your, your hand knows ways to catch the ball. There's a way to teach a kid how to catch a ball. Anybody done the little league or softball? Well, yeah, well, you have to see it. Because if you turn like this, it's really hard to coordinate behavior. But there's like there's a there's a thing that you put one, two, three, four, five. There are ways to hold your glove that you tell the kids to mimic these positions all the time. Because the worst thing is that when the balls hit straight at you, for the kid to put their glove like this. Boom. <laughs> but is that a different motor program? But once it becomes automatic. You see the kids, whoosh, they immediately turn their elbow out to catch the ball without thinking about it. And um, we always practice initially with tennis balls for the kids. Well, we go, I'd go to the tennis coach here before she retired, and she'd give me a giant basket of dead tennis balls. Perfect. And we played dodgeball with tennis balls. What do the kids learn pretty quickly? Well, A, you can dodge a wrench, you can dodge a ball. No. 
Um, what they learned very quickly is that they learned that, A, it hurts when you get hit with the ball, but a tennis ball is going to hurt but not break. Okay, but what if you're playing with real baseball? It really hurts. And so the kids learn how to catch the ball or at least not get hit in the face with, by, by playing tennis ball, dodgeball. And if you catch the ball, the other person's out. So it reinforces them practicing their movements. And as you're doing it, you're shaping, moving their hands to make sure they're catching it right. It's really fun. Okay. So, <laughs> reliving. So what do you think inferior does then? Superior colliculi is vision integration. Inferior colliculi is... Anybody ever try to find a cricket in your house? Yeah. Just get a gecko. Let him go. They'll find him. So the frequency that a cricket lets out is a very pure frequency. And because it's a very pure frequency, you can't hear the difference between the space of your head and where the cricket is. So normally, how do we find where things are? You turn, you, you turn your head side to side to try to find something. And then, I don't know if my, my Google will do this, but. Hey, Google, set timer for two seconds. Sure, two seconds. And that's starting now. So it's quiet. So can you turn around and hear where it's louder or softer? That is your, it's irritating. OK, that is your inferior colliculi. Inferior colliculi are paying attention to sound. Humans don't do it very well at all. But animals like sheep and geckos, they're very good at it. It's actually interesting that a gecko, you ever notice a gecko's head's a really strange shape? It comes in and points, but also the top of it comes in and points like this. Um, the reason is, is because the distance between their ears is the right frequency to find bugs. So whatever frequency their typical food source likes, their head is the right frequency distance so that they can echolocate crickets. No problem. Um, biology floor at San Diego State, someone dropped the giant cardboard box of crickets you get from the cricket farm. These feed a lot of their animals crickets. And so they dropped the box of crickets. So what happened? Attica! Oh, crickets are free in the building. So you go by the building at the third floor of the biology building at San Diego State at 8 o'clock at night, and you, all you would hear is like a 1,000 crickets. And so if you're late in your office working, you're kind of going slightly insane by all the cricket sounds. And you try to find them, and you don't want to spray poison because we don't care about the students. It's because of all the other animals that you have. You have tons of fruit flies up there that are very sensitive. And so what they did is they just got two of the professors went out and bought two or three geckos and let them go. In a couple of weeks, some fat geckos and no more crickets. <laughs> And it'd be great, because you'd be walking through the biology building and sitting up on the wall, there's like, <laughs> you can't see me. <laughs> You're on a beige wall, dude. You're green. I can see you. It's OK. I'm camouflaged. <laughs> um, and there's a sign, please don't hurt the geckos. And all the biology students are like, yeah, we're working. Leave us alone. Yeah. <laughs> Service animal. <laughs> okay. So the colliculi, OK, the colliculi are really important because they're actually the part of the midbrain. They're a part of the midbrain. The, so the midbrain sits between the top part and the lower parts, obviously. And think about the midbrain as activation. The midbrain is the activation part. So how do I know when to activate my reflexes? Well, how do you know? How do you know how to reach, how to move your hand to catch something? The visual systems prime your motor cortex to move. The visual systems tell to activate the reflex. It's like the go now part. So inside the midbrain, I have a slice a little bit further down. Inside the midbrain, down inside the pons, I'm going to go down to a slice here so I can show you what it looks like.
No, oh, it's not a good slice, is it? In this slice, that's there it is. So here is you're looking again at the you're looking at the person's face. This person's looking toward you. This is cut right inside the pond. Can you use the light switch on? <laughs> or thinking. Hit the other one off. There you go. So if I zoom this in, can you actually see ipsilateral? Look at the look at the things going back, the neurons going back and forth across. Can you see that? Okay, so ipsilateral in the medulla, here's the pond. I wish I had a smart board, that would be cooler. Okay. So now, as we go up, so here's the pawns. Here is the midbrain. This is called the substantia nigra. This is called the substantia nigra. Hit the one side of the lights back on, please. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, with your phone trying to cut. Okay. Okay, so the substantia nigra are these really dark colored cells inside the midbrain that connect the top part of the brain to the lower parts of the brain. The substantia nigra is what activates motor programs. So there's a disorder called Parkinson's disease, which affects the substantia nigra. What happens to people when they have Parkinson's disease? They have what's called tremors. So the way you get a tremor, um, you can all actually do this if, you, if your legs are tired and you put your foot up on something. You can actually get it to start bouncing. Yeah. Don't be doing that on the back of someone's chair, though. Or my daughter was sitting, we were all sitting on the couch last night. We actually had like good Weiner family bonding time without anybody yelling at each other. Very impressive. Okay, but my daughter was sitting with her foot like on me and then on the chest and on like a little foot thing that we're footstool that we have and her foot's doing this. Bang, 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 bang. So what is causing that tremor? Put it. <laughs> They're all bouncing all over the place. What's causing that tremor? Well, so how do you do it? If you think about it, how do you tremor? When you're stressed, you tremor more. You gotta pee? No. No, but you're on the right track. So you're trying, you, you, subtle, you just activate the muscle just enough to put tension on the muscle, but not enough to actually move it. Oh, gotta go, but can't go. There's a good metaphor. But so what you do is you just sit just enough activation on the muscle without actually moving the muscle. And so what happens is you get this stop and go signal competing. And that's what the, what, that's exactly what happens when you have a tremor with, with Parkinson's disease, is that if you want to move your hand, you start activating the muscle, but you can't get enough activation for the muscle to actually move. And so you just stand with a rigid, why is it rigid? It's activating the muscle to move, but it's not enough to actually get the muscle to fully contract or fully relax. You just get this. So my, my grandfather had a drug interaction. Um, that's my wife's grandpa, actually. But he had a drug interaction that caused damage to a substantia nigra. So he, took, he was taking blood pressure medicine, and I, I call this karma, by the way. Because he was, he's, most of his life, he always tried to work the system. Like he got, he hurt his back. He got, in World War II, he got blowed up and he hurt his back. And so he used the disability from his military when he was hurt to pretty much never work his entire life for a real job. Except he was an amazing engineer. He got to work on the Deep, Deep Star 9, the bathysphere that went down the Marianas Trench. Did all this really cool stuff. Extremely athletic, extremely, but claiming disability his whole life. <laughs> Bad karma. So he was playing his two insurances against each other that he had. Going to one doctor for a heart problem, the other doctor for something else, and didn't tell each other doctor about each other doctor. Is that a good idea? 
Yeah, but he was, he was actually getting more money from the insurance by doing it that way. So he was working the system. Well, the problem is they prescribed one drug for his heart that interacted with a drug for his blood pressure. Because he didn't talk to the two doctors, that caused his Parkinson's disease. And it damaged the cells in the substantia nigra. So he woke up in the morning and he was completely rigid. They thought he had a stroke. And me being the person who studies this stuff going, oh, I'll bet he's had a bad drug interaction. And it's this, because I watched a video about this once a long time ago in college. <laughs> My sister's like, no way. And then she went on to explain that he probably had a stroke and on and on and on. Sister's a doctor, by the way. I'm not. However, what did they find out? I called it. So they gave him, they gave him medication so he could actually function. And we know the side effect of the medicine they give for Parkinson's disease? Say it louder. You said something. Or, OK. What's the side effect? If I give you. If, no, it doesn't give you a stroke. Well, OK, so this, the neurons that are in here are dopamine neurons. You activate your motor signals by using dopamine. So what if I give you more dopamine? More activation, which the side effect of more dopamine activation is paranoia. And sometimes hallucinations. The people become extremely agitated, paranoid, and sometimes can become slightly schizophrenic with too much dopamine activation. So he started becoming extremely paranoid and firing all his nurses because they were stealing from him. Yes, one of them was, but that's not important. OK. OK, so have we even scratched the surface of this thing yet? No, but have we actually, are you starting to understand how this brain thing works? Yeah, you think you do. Okay, sorry. 